Hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the time zones that are you in. Uh, we are extremely glad to welcome all of you to the fourth talk of the monthly colloquium series by Karinas. We are very delighted to have Professor Sarvani Basu as our today's colloquium speaker. Uh, well, before getting started with the talk, I'll say a few words about this forum, Karinas. Uh, Karinas currently has more than 300 Indian researchers working in astrophysics and related fields. And uh, with 41% within India and 46% who are currently studying or working abroad. And 87% of our members are early career researchers who are in the formative stage of their careers. These are the stages in which we start losing women researchers from academia due to various reasons. And this forum's goal is to empower this early career women researchers in India and first generation Indian women researchers outside the country throughout networking, uh, support, mentorship, knowledge sharing and collaboration uh, whenever it's required. Uh, so we aim to address gender inequity in a bottom up approach and create a safe, friendly and inclusive environment and collaborate with other national international organizations to amplify our impact. Uh, among our initiatives towards reaching these goals, we have started a newsletter series where we not only focus on the great sciences done by women researchers, but also their life experiences in academia. Uh, for example, our first newsletter captures the experience of three generations of women astronomers. And the next edition is going to launch uh, in this week with some very exciting content. So stay tuned and also check out our website, karinas.co.in for all of these updates. Uh, so, yeah, I'll just pass on the virtual mic to Prakriti to introduce uh, Sarvani. Thank you, Monami. Um, we are, again, very happy to welcome Professor Shorbani Basu today as our fourth speaker. Uh, Shorbani is uh, William K. Landman Jr. Professor of Astronomy at Yale University. Uh, Shorbani did her uh, PhD in India, in TIFR, and uh, this was in 1993. She did uh, postdoctoral research at Queen's Mary and Westfield College, London, and then University of Aarhus in Denmark, before moving to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. And uh, then in 2000, she joined Yale University. And she served as the chair of the Department of Astronomy between 2016 and 2022. So um, Sharvani's research is in solar and stellar astrophysics, uh, general properties and details of, uh, as well as the details uh, of the structure and dynamics of sun, focusing on solar cycle dependence, dependencies, um, her interest in the sun uh, is in the general astronomical context as well, and also to use astroseismic data uh, from Kepler and TESS spacecrafts to study other stars. Uh, she has published over 300 peer-reviewed articles and a full-length book. So um, other than, uh, of course, her research, she has this uh, very... Uh, excellent career of many, many awards, including Vainu Bappu Gold Medal for the from the Astronomical Society of India in 1996 for her works on uh, helioseismology. Then she was awarded George, George Ellery Hell Award for um, from the Solar Physics Division of the AAAS. This was in 2018. Uh, she got uh, NSF Career Award in 2004. She was the elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2015. And then also she was an elected uh, fellow in the inaugural batch of the double AS in 2020. Um, she is currently serving at as the in the steering committee of the solar and space physics decadal survey and she has previously chaired the stellar and solar physics for the 2020 astrophysics decadal survey so um clearly a very um we are very very happy to have uh, someone like her today 
and uh, without further delay we will uh, uh, we will give the virtual mic to shorbani today and we are very excited for your talk looking forward to it thank you thank you prakriti that, for your kind invitation and i must say it's a pleasure to be in this forum i had known of, i had not known of this forum and i plan to be associated with this now that i know of it what I want to talk to you today is how do we study stars in particular? How do we know what we are doing is correct? The reason for studying stars is that a lot of ast astronomy and astrophysics is basically based on what we know of stars. When we find ages of galaxies, of the stellar population of galaxies, when we find and characterize exoplanet systems, we need to know what the stars are doing. And the question then is, are we doing it correctly? So let me step back a bit because whether or not we're doing stellar properties correctly depends on whether or not we're modeling the stars correctly. And modeling stars is actually surprisingly simple in terms of the physics involved. Uh, all, all we do is solve for a couple of you know, conservation equations. So it's conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, thermal equilibrium, transportation of energy, which of course needs input of radiative opacities, which is a can of worms. Then we need nuclear reaction rates, which are fairly well known. We need to figure out how abundances in different parts of a star changes. And we need to know the equation of state, which is reasonably well known. There are a few regions where we still have a problem. So people have been modeling stars since the early 1920s, not necessarily with the correct physics, but this is where the star comes. Now, if I take a model of the sun, for example, and what do we find? There's going to be a nuclear reaction, a nuclear energy generating core right at the center. Then there's the radiative zone where energy is transported from the core to the outer layers by radiation. Then there's a the convection zone where energy is transported by convection, in other words, by the movement of material rather than photons. And the question is, how do we know that our models are correct? Just because we can fit model the temperature and luminosity of a star, are we getting the interiors correct? After all, it's the interiors that determine how the star is going to evolve and what happens. Now, as early as 1926, in the first ever stellar astrophysics textbook, The Internal Constitution of Stars, Arthur Eddington said, our telescopes may probe farther and farther into space, but how do we look inside? What is inside? How do we look inside a star? What can we do to pierce the outer opaque layers of a star and figure out what is happening inside? So he asked, what appliance can pierce through the outer layers of the star? And he was, of course, a clever man and Basically, the appliance is pulsate, pulsations of stars, or what's known today as asteroseismology, meaning the study of tremors of stars. Okay. Now, helioseismology is the same thing, but for the sun, it's got a slightly older history than astroseismology as we know it today. But both helio and astroseismology differ from what geophysicists do to study the Earth. When you study the Earth, what is done is you have an earthquake at one point and you wait to see the seismic signatures far away from the epicenter. And the time traveled tells you, can be used to figure out what's happening between, in the inner layers of the Earth. In the case of helio and astro seismology, we use normal modes, meaning, you have a body in equilibrium, you give it a slight perturbation, it'll oscillate till it comes back to equilibrium. And those are the modes 
that we study. These are the eigen modes of a star. Now, pulsating stars are everywhere on the HR diagram. So you have the usual HR diagram, log temperature here, log luminosity here. That's our main sequ sequence. The different colors and shading refer to pulsations because of different kinds of mechanisms with different kinds of stars. The one that has proved very useful so far are the ones that show these horizontal striations. These are the so-called solar-like oscillators. These stars oscillate in exactly the same manner. I won't say exactly the same manner, but for the same reasons as the sun. These are stars which have an outer convection zone. And this outer convection zone um, basically acts. Yes. Uh, so in the previous plot, what are the different colors? These are just different types of stars. Okay. And the hashing. So these are white dwarfs of different kinds, for example. These are all stars that are where the pulsations are excited because of differences in opacity. These are believed to be stars where it's the energy generation that causes issues. So I'm going to concentrate on these stars where the hash mark is horizontal. And these are stars where we call solar-like oscillations. All these stars have an outer convection zone. And this outer convection zone of boiling, roiling gas is what causes the star to pulsate. These are small pulsations, not like Cepheids or R Lyres, where the amplitudes of pulsations are huge. Here we are talking about pulsations with amplitudes of parts per million. So think of it this way, our classical pulsators that we learn about, you know, like our Lyrae stars and Cephe variables, those ring as the think of a bell and you're hitting the bell. So you'll get one mode very loud. In the case of solar-like stars, you have the bell, but you're not hitting it. You're throwing grains of sand on it. So a very low level hum. And because you're not hitting it, it's not a forced oscillator, which means if you wait long enough, you can see many, 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 many frequencies. It's like a string, a musical instrument string. You pluck a frequency, you pluck a string, you get the fundamental, you get the first harmonic, you get the second harmonic, you get all the frequencies. And that's what happens in solar-like pulsators. So why do we bother? So we can determine precise and very likely accurate masses and radii of field stars. Masses of stars can only be obtained other than through seismology if you have binaries, because it's the binaries that allow you to, you know, using Kepler's law and Newton's laws to figure out the masses. If you have a field star, or a star not in a cluster, it's almost impossible to find the mass. Except saying, oh, we know the luminosity. If we had a binary star, it's luminosity. At a given luminosity, this is the mass. So this is the mass of the star. Similarly, radii, except for the very large stars where you can find a direct measurement of radius uh, through interferometry and also in eclipsing binaries, you can't find radii of field stars at all. So astroseismology gives us the means to determine masses and radii of field stars. And if you know a mass, you know an age, because the age of stars is directly related to the mass, which then gives us the tools to do other types of astrophysics. For example, the whole field of galactic archaeology, which once upon a time was used to be known as the chemical evolution of the galaxy, has become possible now because we have actual ages of individual stars and we have positions and velocities from Gaia. So now you can do proper archaeology of the solar system, oh, sorry, of the galaxy. And the reason I do it, not so much as for astroseismology as a tool, but to actually understand what happens inside stars. What is the physics? Okay, what is the physics that governs the star? Because then you can predict 
are we getting the evolution right? Because if we don't get the evolution right, all our models and theories about what stars go on to form a supernova and enrich the universe, et cetera, et cetera, they're not going to be correct either. So we so, have got a question, which is mm -hmm. uh, from Nitin Raghote. Is the mass of star reduced as its age is increased? Um, depends on whether or not you have substantial, substantial stellar winds. So if a low mass star is like the sun, we are currently losing about 10 to the minus 14 solar masses per year, which is nothing meaning in the lifetime of the sun, it won't lose much. It is believed that in very evolved stages of a star, mass loss increases because the outer layers become less bound to the inner part. And if you have very high mass stars, I'm talking about 15, 20, 25 solar mass stars, they're just radiation pressure from the star because the stars are very, very hot, can... Uh, can induce mass loss in stars. So the question is, it depends. So the answer to your question is, it depends. For low mass stars, uh, for most of its lifetime, no. Okay, so let me give you a crash course in astroseismology. Stars oscillate technically in millions of different modes. It's a different matter that we can't see them all. For solar-like oscillators, not Cepheids or RLI rays, for solar-like oscillators, the oscillations are linear and adiabatic. What do I mean by linear? If I look at the velocity corresponding to each mode, it's about a few, at the surface, is about tens of centimeters per second. The sound speed, which is what actually determines the frequencies of these modes, at the surface of the sun is 10 kilometers per second. So we are perfectly in the linear regime, adiabatic, because the pulsations have periods of, you know, minutes to hours, while the Kelvin-Helmholtz time scale, which determines the uh, heat transport, the time scale of heat transport, is much, much, much larger. So we are in a lovely regime. So how do we? It's a three-dimensional object, so we need three numbers to characterize the modes. One is n, which is called the, the radial order, which is the number of nodes inside the star, okay? Then there's L, the degree, which is the number of nodes on the circumference. And M is the azimuthal order, which is the number of nodes along the equator. So the L and M are actually, these are the angular parameters, and because the stars are generally symmetric, we represent the angular dependence as spherical harmonics, just like go back to your, you know, hydrogen atom wave function, you have YLMs, and these are the same YLMs. Now, think of M, it's the number of nodes along the equator, which means if the star didn't rotate, we couldn't define an equator. So if the star didn't rotate, um, we, M's don't matter, wouldn't matter. So it's like the degenerate energy levels of a hydrogen atom, okay? You put in a magnetic field or an electric field, you lift the degeneracy. In the case, and energy levels become M dependent. And in this case, the frequency becomes M dependent if you add rotation or magnetic fields. As long as you can define an equator, you need the M's. So the reason we can study stars with astroseismology or helioseismology is that different modes sample different parts of the star. So you can build up a picture inside out. So this is what I was talking about. If the stars were spherically symmetric and didn't rotate, we wouldn't bother about M's. Uh, for slow rotation like the sun, we can basically take the different M's, define a central frequency, which only depends on structure. So that is what we do for structure and the M dependent part, we find rotation. So let's start with the sun, okay? How do we observe the modes? For the sun, we can see the surface. So you take Doppler images, not intensity images because those have inherently more noise, but Doppler images. So if you take a Doppler image of the sun, the first signature you see is rotation. This is about two kilometers per second. 
you remove rotation and you see giant cells of convection, you remove that, then you see oscillations. And this is actual data showing the sun oscillating. And this is a superposition of many, many, many different modes. You then have to you know, do usual mathematical transforms to find out the frequencies of these modes. So what do the data sets look like? I'm only going to talk about the central frequency, not about M's. So this is the spherical harmonic degree. So remember L of zero is the breathing mode. The star is going in and out. It's called the radial mode. L of one, half the star is going in while the other half is going out. L of two, two nodes. So two are going out, one is going in and vice versa. So as you increase L, the horizontal wavelength at the surface decreases. So this is a one-year data set from the sun. The reason I've color coded it is for other stars, we will only see this red bit. Most of the work for the sun we do using the red and the cyan bits. The modes in blue have a lot more uncertainty, so we don't generally use that except for very special reasons. So this would be a typical data set that would be used to determine what's going on inside the star. And the astounding part is not that this is the data set, but these are 5,000 sigma errors. When you have data which is this precise, there's a lot you can do. So that is what basically enables us to do a lot of seismology. So what does the solar interior actually look like? Okay, so what do we do? Now, in the case of the sun, because we have so much data, we don't build models and try to match frequencies. We take the frequencies and invert them to figure out what the structure of the sun is. Now, the relationship between the structure and frequencies is given with an equation like this. The only thing you have to know is that omega is the frequency, Rho is the density, C is sound speed, not speed of light, sound speed. Pressure, pressure, of course, in a star is related to density. G is acceleration due to gravity, which is also density. Psi is the eigenfunction. In other words, the mode frequencies depend only on sound speed and density, okay? Which makes the problem easy, but it also means we can't really study things like, you know, what do the nuclear reaction rates look like? But the problem with this equation is that, yes, we can observe omega squared. We want c squared and rho, but we can't observe the eigenfunctions, except very close to the surface, okay? And even then, not really very well. So what do we do? And this is where Chandrasekhar, same Chandrasekhar as the Chandrasekhar limit, showed in 1964, even before helioseismology was appealed, he was doing a purely theoretical calculation that the equations of linear adiabatic pulsations of a star form a Hermitian eigenvalue problem, which is the same type of equation, for example, the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics is, which means we can use the variational principle and do a perturbative analysis. So what we do is we take a take the sun and we linearize the structure of the sun around a known model. And what we get is that the relative difference in the fre frequencies of the model and a star or the sun in this case, depends on two integrals. One that depends on the sound squared sound, difference of the squared sound speed. One that depends on the difference of density they're connected by known functions. These are the eigenfunctions, but remember variational analysis, first order and perturbation. The eigenfunction of the perturbed state is the eigenfunction of the unperturbed state. So we can use the eigenfunction of the model. And we have to add a term because we can't really model surfaces of stars very well. Does this work? So what I'm showing here are the inversion results between two, two solar models. 
the points are the inversion results that I get. This is the relative difference in frequent in sound speed, relative difference in density. The points are the inverted results using the frequencies of the two models alone. And the underlying line is the actual difference between the two. So in other words, we can invert. You see differences here, and that's because our inversions have finite spatial resolutions. So if you have a very sharp feature, you can't really catch it in the inversion. It's like the spatial resolution of a telescope, if you wish. So what does the sun look like? So here I'm showing the relative squared sound speed difference and density difference between the sun and two solar models. These are two fairly modern solar models with fairly modern physics. The difference between the two is a slight difference in the physical inputs, particularly the opacities. What I want you to look at is not that there are many, many, many sigma differences. We'll come to that first. But look at the scale. That's a 0.5% difference. Okay, and this is a 2% difference, which for most of astrophysics is a zero difference. So in other words, yes, our models are very good, but we are missing some physics. So for example, this feature we know now arises because, let me come to that in a minute. So how do we use this to constrain physical processes? So these are two models with exactly the same inputs, but the blue model the red model assumes that helium and other heavy elements sink down over time under gravity relative to hydrogen. The blue model does not include that. And you can see that the red model is so much better than the blue model. Because if we had a perfect model, the difference would be zero, of course. Oops, wrong way. So why is this feature here? So we have gravitational settling in our model. But in, real, in the real sun, there is gravitational settling, otherwise we wouldn't get the model so well. But there's also rotation, which causes turbulence at the boundary of the convection zone. That's the boundary of radiation here, convection here. And when you have turbulence, it sort of smooths out the sound speed profile. Our models don't have a smooth sound speed profile compared to the sun. So that's why this happens. We still don't know what's causing this. So that's still a bit of a mystery. So we can actually do more fundamental physics. For example, the solar neutrino problem, which was a problem in astrophysics that lasted 35 years, and now you don't even hear about it because it's completely solved. The problem is this. Nuclear reactions produce neutrinos. In fact, if you the, the absolute proof that the nuclear reactions in in stars is that you could observe solar neutrinos, neutrinos from stars, okay? So this is the neutrino flux from different um, nuclear reactions in the sun. Now, what happened is when we observe the neutrinos, the flux of the neutrinos, observed neutrinos, this is in blue, these four are four different experiments, which are sensitive to different energy ranges was always lower than the predicted flux. And this was an issue for nearly more than 30 years because the first thing everybody said is, oh, our solar models are not right. But helioseismology has told us that our solar models are actually correct. And now this is the same sound speed difference that I'd shown, but on a much expanded scale, because if I needed to artificially change the interior of a solar model to get the neutrinos right, then the sound speed difference wouldn't be 0.1% at the center, it'll be 10%. In other words, that model would not really match the sun at all. So that is when we first said that, oh, no, 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 no. We are fine. Don't blame astrophysicists for the, solar uh, for the solar neutrino problem. It has to be a particle physics problem. And what was the problem? 
It is that particle, most standard models of particle physics assume that neutrinos are massless. So you have electron type neutrinos, mu type neutrinos, and tau type neutrinos. If they don't have mass, electron type neutrinos cannot become mu type neutrinos. They can't change character. And that was the assumption. However, if you can change electron to mu type neutrinos, you can explain this graph. So what happened, of course, you know, particle physicists don't believe astrophysicists, so they built the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which can detect both electron and mu type neutrinos, and that is the result. The agreement between observed neutrinos, electron plus mu type, is, you know, embarrassingly close to that of what is predicted from the sun. So that was the absolute end of the solar neutrino problem. You don't even hear about it now. In fact, now the tables have turned and particle physicists use solar neutrino observations to try and put constraints on neutrino properties. That was very satisfying actually, because particle physicists think, oh, you astrophysicists, you wave your hands about too much. You make too many approximations. What was unexpected, though, when we looked at helioseismology, we got the structure right, but we did not get rotation right. The expected rotation, interior rotation rate of the sun was that if you take the rotation axis, the rotation rate at different depths and different latitudes could be described by cutting the sun into cylinders, and each cylinder has its own rotation rate. In other words, the isorotation contours would be parallel to the rotation axis. What we see instead is nothing like this, but this. The rotation rate is, of course, dependent on latitude. That had been known. Even this picture will give you uh, a latitudinal differential rotation, but that the contours of isorotation in the convection zone are almost radial. Then there's a sharp change to near solid body rotation. The reason these white spaces is because solar modes can't really um, detect, are not sensitive to rotation, very sensitive to rotation there unfortunately. So we still don't exactly know it does the solid body continue to the very center. There's no reason not to believe that. On the other hand, yeah, we don't know. Similarly, we quite don't know what happens at the poles. So what else have we learned? So we've learned a bit more about physics because you can make uh, tests of stellar equations of state, other physical processes, and of course, we do solar cycle related changes. But we can also study what about other stars? Now, when it was actually first the French satellite Corot, then Kepler, and now TESS, which has allowed us to do, you know, large scale astro seismology of other stars. But astro seismology of other stars is very different because we can't see the surface of a star. We only see the star as one pixel. So we can't get data on low wavelength oscillations of oscillations that have low wavelengths on the surface because they just cancel out. The positives and the negatives and the positives and the negatives will cancel out. But nonetheless, what do we see? Now other stars, the other thing is, you can't, spectroscopy in space is extremely expensive. So instead of, you know, doing Doppler images, we just do intensity. So instead of a time series of Doppler shifts, we get a time series of intensity. Now these both show data from Kepler. The top is a classical pulsator, a Cepheid. You can see the pulsations in the light curve with your eye. If you do an FFT, you actually see two modes. This is a double mode Cepheid. So that'll lie somewhere here on the HR diagram. A solar-like oscillator, 16 sig A, for example, which was one of the brightest in the Kepler field, will look like this. You know, looks noisy, nothing else. 
except if you take an FFT and remove the background, you'll see many modes of oscillation. What do the data look like? If you just take an FFT, you'll first see something like this. The background at low frequencies is actually stellar noise, as we call it. That is outer convection. So people who study convection love this. Most of us hate it because it introduces noise to this path, which is named B modes, which is our signal, okay? Particularly at the low frequency end. So B modes stand out as an envelope over a smooth background when you do an FFT of a time series of an intensity time series, say from Kepler or Tess. Now, if you take a close up look at this, you'll find a feature that looks like this. And the interesting thing here is if you smooth this enough, it's almost a Gaussian like shape. The position of the peak of the Gaussian is actually related to the surface gravity, m over r squared, times one over the square root of the surface temperature. So we call this mu max, meaning the frequency of maximum power, not the maximum frequency, but the frequency of maximum power. That can be related to the surface gravity and with a small factor of the temperature of a star. Now let's remove the background and look in detail into these peaks. Now, before doing that, new max, remember, is where the power is the most. So if I line up stars of different surface gravities, it actually gives you an roughly the same mass, it gives you an evolutionary sequence. Main sequence, slightly more evolved, more evolved, more evolved. This is already at the base of the red giant branch. These are red giants. So, so as you get older, your frequencies shift to the lower frequency side. Because what happens as a star gets older, it gets bigger, which means the surface gravity decreases, which means new max will also decrease. Let's take a closer look at these frequencies. If you look at that, you'll find that the frequencies are spaced almost equally. So these high amplitude frequencies are the L of zero modes. Next to the L of zero are L of two modes. The one in between is an L of one mode. Next to the L of one, this is a solar spectrum actually, is an L of three mode, which for other stars, we generally don't see because it's difficult to see in intensity. Now, the distance between L of two L of zero modes, two consecutive L of zero modes, is known as the large frequency separation. And that scales as the mean density of the star. So now we have two quantities, which are easily uh, determined from observations. One is new max, which goes as the surface gravity with a small dependence on temperature. And one is delta nu, which goes as the square root of the mean density, which means I have two relations with two unknowns if I can figure the, determine the temperature of a star. And which means I can find the mass and the radius of a star. The squiggles here are because this relation is approximate. You will get up to a 5% error in mass and a 3% error in radius. 5 to 10%, depending on where you are, error in mass. But that is still better than having a 100% error in mass or a 50% error in radius, which is what we used to get previously. So just getting, having even you know, not very good astroseismic data, you can find the masses and radii. Of course, if you have good data, then we don't use this at all. We actually try to model the frequencies. Okay. So we have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what are the conditions in the star that determine the mode of pulsation of the stars, a single mode or double mode? Oh, so for Cepheids, it's, again, 
So for the stars I'm talking about, the solar-like oscillators, you can actually see all modes if you're patient enough because they're stochastically excited. So if you wait long enough, every mode will be excited. Okay. For cepheids and others, it depends on the excitation mechanism. And people are still trying to figure out exactly what causes that. There are theories about, but yeah. But this type of star I study and the type of oscillations I study, you just have to wait. If, you if you're patient enough, you'll see the mode. However, the, the amplitude of the mode is modulated by this envelope. So at very high frequencies, you're not going to see. But then the theory of stellar pulsation also tells you that if you have very high frequencies, the modes are not eigenmodes anymore. So you won't be able to use them to do the sort of study. And at low frequencies, of course, granulation gives us, you know, adds, takes over from the frequency. So granulation noise increases. So I hope that answered the question a bit. So just knowing delta nu and nu max, we can get masses and radii, okay? And ages are of course model dependent because the only star for which we have an independent measure of age is the sun. Because you look at old meteorites, which have where the material inside the meteor, outside the surface layers of the meteorite have not been disturbed then you can do a radioactive dating of those meteorites to figure out how old the sun is. And that's about 4.57 billion years old. For other stars, it's the physics of our models that determines the age. So there are systematic errors in age. But once you know a precise mass, the random errors in age reduce. So it's a statistical error versus systematic error thing now. It's the systematic errors that dominate now. So what else have we been doing? We've been finding, for example, ages of exoplanet systems. So this was a work done early in the days of Kepler. Okay. So we had, these are all exoplanet hosts on a modified HR diagram. So instead of luminosity here, we have the lot separation. Okay. Uh, but the, the tracks being just stellar tracks. And there is one particular system which had five planets. And it was interesting because it is a very, very old system. And it used to be thought that if you have such an old system, which is, you know, all, I mean, it's way older than the sun. I mean, it was as old as the sun is now when the sun was born. And it used to be thought that such old systems couldn't really form rocky planets, but these are all rocky planets, so they do form. So this allowed us immediately to say that no, the age of a planetary system doesn't seem to affect things too much. Uh, then when we come to star clusters, so star clusters, are, you know, stars born from the same cloud of gas, they have the same age and the same metallicity, which means in stellar evolution terms, you can remove some of the degeneracies of modeling. And prior to seismology and prior to, I mean, doing, getting masses and radii from eclipsing binaries, Clusters were the only places where you could find the age of the ensemble of stars. You would fit what's known as isochrones and find the age of a star. But with astroseismology, what you can do is find the ages of the individual stars. So these are the, this is the age distribution of individual stars in light gray. And then put in the condition that the ages of all the stars have to be the same, which then immediately peaks your likelihood function because you're multiplying all the likelihood functions. So you get a very precise age. And this is the same thing done for initial helium abundance because that's one of the big unknowns of stellar astrophysics because you can't determine the helium abundance of a star from its spectra. You can only see helium in very hot star spectra. And yet helium changes the direction of evolution. 
So with our result, we could constrain both the age and the helium very precisely. This was the work done with one of my by one of my uh, postdocs. And this is our result. These were the other results from literature. You can see error bars in the age. Nobody has error bars in Y because they all assumed a Y because there was no way to know what the Y is. So that's why you see this main trend between age and Y here. This is an outlier, that, that's why you see that. We could constrain both and that's just due to seismology. We are now looking at, can we constrain physical processes such as overshoot from convective cores? So the sun doesn't have a convective core, it has a radiative core. But you take a star, which is 10% more massive than the sun, 10 to 15% more massive than the sun. Those stars have a convective core and whether there is overshoot from the core, meaning if the material from the core goes into the radiative zone and mixing in more, mixes in more hydrogen, that'll change the age of a star, the lifetime of a star, because you're bringing in more fresh hydrogen for the star to burn. And there have been many efforts um, in literature trying to get the, to see if there's a relation between the amount of overshoot and the mass of a star. So this is a compilation made by my current student, uh, Christopher Lindsay and the red points are the ones he derived. Blue points are the ones my one of my previous students derived, but the work is not exactly equivalent. So we need to revisit that to see why that is showing a steeper relation than all the others, but that's a different issue. But in other words, we are beginning to constrain physical processes that affect the evolution of stars. We are doing also for envelope overshoot, we're beginning to be able to do inversions for other stars, except for the other stars, because we only have L of zero, one and two modes, we can only invert the structure at the core and look at structural differences in the core. So this was one of the first ones that was done by a former student of mine, and now my colleague actually, he just joined Yale as his assistant professor, and he showed that we saw this difference in structure between this star, which has a convective core and our models and nothing we did to our models got rid of this. So the student, another student who's a student of my collaborator is now trying inversions of other stars. So these are all stars with radiative cores. We generally do quite well. And we are now looking at stars with convective cores and figure out, was this a one-off or do we really have problem modeling the convective cores of stars? No. But the, like in the case of the sun, the biggest mysteries are in stellar rotation. Now, stellar rotation is interesting. So as a star evolves, the core contracts and the envelope expand. So you expect the core just by, you know, angular momentum conservation to spin up. And we see white dwarfs and neutron stars spin quite rapidly. And the envelope slows down, A, because it's expanding, and B, because it's losing angular momentum through magnetic fields and stellar winds. Okay. So what was expected was if you look at an evolved star, particularly, you know, maybe the base of the red giant branch, uh, the core would should be rotating something like a factor of many tens, maybe even a hundred times faster than the envelope. Envelope rotation we can see. Core rotation now we can do thanks to seismology. And what we found, this is the first case, I'll explain the figure in a minute, but what we found is that the core rotates only a factor of 10 faster than the envelope instead of a factor of nearly 100, which means there are angular momentum transport, transport processes inside a star that are not included in our models, okay? So the black points are observations plotted against where the mode is most sensitive to as a function of radius. 
The red points are the model that fit the data. Okay, blue points clearly don't fit the data. Um, which was a surprise. Okay, but then later, as we gathered more data, the surprise was, yes, we knew from the 1970s, 80s, that as, as stars get older, the surface slows down. And the law that the surface slows down is known as the Skumanich law, which is basically, if this is the rotation period, you expect the uh, the period to increase like this black curve. But with seismology, we now can find ages. So we can actually put stars on this diagram. And you can see they don't follow this curve. The slowdown seems to slow down. And the sun is sort of at a critical space where the slowdown slows down. We're trying to understand this. It probably has to do to, to with the fact that since it's magnetic fields that slow down the envelope the most, um, if the star loses rotation, at some point it can't regenerate magnetic fields because magnetic fields are generate, believed to be generated by a dynamo which operates because the star rotates. And if you can't, if you don't rotate fast enough, you don't see the dynamo, I mean, the dynamo gets weaker, if the dynamo gets weaker, the magnetic fields get weaker, if the magnetic fields get weaker, the loss of angular momentum gets weaker, which means the star won't slow down much further. So that is what the picture seems to be emerging. So since we are almost out of time, I'm just going to leave you with some thoughts. One is that astroseismology has revolutionized the study of stellar interiors. We no longer have to depend on star clusters and just two points of data, the luminosity and the temperature, and fit stars on a nature diagram and claim, look, we've got a model of the star. So not only are we beginning to be able to determine the structure and dynamics of stellar interiors, we are beginning to be able to study physical processes that happen inside a star, okay? And we're beginning to see interesting differences between our models. Yes, our models are very good, but the differences are still many, many, many sigma. Okay, just because it's a 0.1% difference doesn't mean it's statistically important because the 0.1% difference or the 0.5% difference in the case of the sun was a whopping 50 sigma difference. Okay, so the differences are interesting and we're beginning to be able to exploit them. And what we're seeing is that we really don't understand stellar interior rotation. So we are going to have to take a fresh look. So thank you very much for your attention and giving me this opportunity to speak. And I'll be happy to take a few more questions if you have any. Thank you, Shorbani. That was an excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so uh, I think we can uh, start a question answer. And uh, in the people in the audience, please feel free to uh, ask and raise hand, and then we can unmute and you can ask directly. So I can actually start off uh, if there is, I cannot see any raised hands yet. Yeah, I don't see any. So go ahead, please. Um, so can, how... Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, we know that uh, how the black hole is created because okay. uh, the star collapses under its gravity. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit how does this process happen? when the star okay. burns out? So this is not my area of expertise. I only know what I learned in grad school. Okay. okay. So what happens here is you, as you first, the star first fuses hydrogen to helium, then helium to carbon and oxygen, then you form 
neon, then you form, um, you know, after neon comes what? Silicon, I think. But anyway, and then silicon burning produces iron. Okay, each of these burning processes produces energy, which heats up the gas, which produces the pressure to counteract gravity. But once you form an iron core, iron, you cannot fuse it to get uh, energy, nor does fission give you energy. So you basically have no energy source left. So there's nothing to counteract gravity. So the iron core starts collapsing, okay? Different processes happen that uh, contribute to robbing the core of more energy. So it's it sort of the, the uh, collapse accelerates and even, and these are stars of such high mass that even when the core becomes electron degenerate, even the degeneracy pressure, electron degeneracy pressure can't counteract gravity. So it collapses further till it basically the core neutronizes, meaning all the uh, uh, the protons capture the free electrons and become neutrons. These are not free anymore because they're bound in. Okay, so they don't. The neutrons don't have a chance to decay. So this collapses further, but Nuclear process, nuclear material, there's a limit to how much collapse it can collapse. So it collapses beyond the point and then bounces back. And it's the bounce back, which is the supernova. Okay. Okay. okay I, thank you so much. Yeah. I don't do research in high mass stars, but my research is connected to high mass stars through. Because the physical processes that take place in a star will change the structure. So we can test the physical processes in these low mass stars and say, okay, yeah, all high mass stars have convective cores. So you need this much overshoot and you need these processes. Otherwise, the answers are going to be wrong. Yeah, and there is Chandrasekhar limit that determines whether it will be a white dwarf. Are you yeah, no, but no, Chandrasekhar limit, right? the Chandrasekhar limit gives you the mass which can be supported by electron degeneracy. But in these yeah. high mass stars that will become supernovae, core collapse supernovae, the core is well above the Chandrasekhar mass. So the electron degeneracy pressure cannot support the core. So it keeps collapsing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Nitin. Uh, there is uh, a raised hand, uh, Mrutunjaya um, Muduli. Can you please uh, unmute and ask? Yeah. Uh, hello, ma'am. Thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, actually, I had two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, um, how do we detect the seismic activity in the sun? And the second question is, uh, why do the old stars rotate faster than younger stars? As you send the PPT. Uh, hold on. Sorry. Let me go back to how we detect oscillations in the sun. Of course, these are sound waves, but sound doesn't travel through space. So what we are looking at is the effect of oscillations on the surface. Okay. So we take Doppler images. So this is a 1K by 1K. So, so much less powerful than our cell phone cameras these days. That can be 1M by 1M. It's a 1K by 1K image of the sun where the pixels are doing a Doppler measurement. So, you can see the scale here. The white is a positive velocity of two kilometers per second, and the red in this case is a negative velocity of two kilometers per second. In the other words, the sun is rotating. So, the part going away from us is at minus two kilometers per second. Okay. So basically, it's a Doppler measurement. We remove the uh, signature of the oscillation uh, of the rotation. We remove the big signature from convection. What remains is the oscillation. For other stars, we just look at the time series of the pulse of the pulse of the intensity. So if we looked at the time series of the intensity of the sun, it'll be a few parts per million. If you go to red giants, it'll be a few hundred parts per thousand. So as 
because the amplitude of the oscillations increase as a power of the uh, luminosity. Uh, so the second question was, why do old stars rotate faster? It's not that the old stars rotate faster. The cores of the old stars are expected to rotate faster than the surface. That's simple conservation of angular momentum. You're shrinking the core, you're expanding the envelope. So of course, when you have something rotating and you make that smaller. Now, I see if here I give my students the analogy of an ice skater, because ice skating is very popular here. People rotate and then they, you know, put their arms together which, which uh, decreases their uh, moment of inertia and then they spin up faster, okay? So that's why you expect the cores to rotate faster than the envelope as the, en as the core becomes uh, smaller because as a star evolves, the core becomes smaller. Yes, the mystery is that they're not as fast as the surface. Uh, I mean, not as fast as you expect them to be compared to the surface. So you had a second part to that question, which I yes, don't. Yes, um, another question, uh, ma'am, that uh, if you that you said that you use Dopp Doppler effect to measure the oscillation in the, in the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, so what about the poles? So how do you measure? You can't. The... No, that's one of the reasons. One of the places we can't observe. So some of us have put in proposals to NASA to fly a mission above the poles, but flying something above the poles is extremely expensive. So we haven't had much success yet. Fortunately for us, we are looking at normal modes, which even though we observed from the equator, the ecliptic rather, do have some sensitivity to the poles. So for the structure, we're looking at this very symmetric part of the structure. But that's also the reason why for rotation, we can't really see much what's happening at the pole. We really need to go up to the pole to be able to see what's going on there. And can't we measure the uh, oscillation from the, uh, by using the uh, differential rotation of the sun? No, the differential rotation is something we get out of oscillations. We only observed, I mean, the classical observations were only at the surface, they're not at the interiors. And the differential rotation observations of the sun made before helioseismology were using things like sunspots. Sunspots do not go above a latitude of much more than 30 plus or minus 30 degrees. Yes, so even, even there, we can't really figure out. But helioseismology actually allows us to go much, for, much higher in latitude. So we can go up to about 75% quite reasonably. So up to 75 degrees, quite reasonably. It's, you know, the polar ring, as we call it, which we have no sensitivity to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Very. very good questions, yeah. These are limitations of the method, which is why we are, we've been asking for a mission to go above the poles. No, because... When Cassini went over the poles of Cassini and Juno, one went, Cassini went over Saturn and Juno went over Jupiter, they found these beautiful spiral structures, you know, Jupiter. So the poles of Saturn had this hexagonal turbulence pattern and the pole of Jupiter had a nested set of worlds. We don't know what the solar pole looks like. Yes, it's the one part of the sun we have no idea what it is like. So, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. I had a question about, um, you know, the age measurements. So now that you can um, have a very precise measurements of the age. Um, no, we have precise measurements of the mass, which translates to a precise measurement of the age. Yes. Yeah, 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 right. So could it somehow give us a better constraint on the initial mass function? Um, not yet, because seismic data, we can't go to very low masses because the amplitudes of oscillations get very, very small. 
So the lowest mass that we've been able to do with Kepler is 0.7 something, I think, solar masses. So the really unknown, interesting part of the IMF, which is the very low mass part, though actually JWST is doing much better there because this semester, we heard two talks from brown dwarf people who are able to, you know, study all these brown dwarfs from JWST. And the chances of constraining the low mass part of the um, initial mass function is much better with JWST. I mean, seismology is not going to do it. And the nice thing about doing the initial mass function of the... Um, sorry, of these brown dwarfs is of course, the difference between the, when you find the difference between the initial mass function and the present day mass function, the correction is easier because all brown dwarfs are still living, all low mass stars are still living. So if you just get a full census at that of the low mass point, you know what it's like. Because of course, at the higher mass end, the you have to account for the finite ages and everything. Yeah, because of, yeah, going back to my bad old days of my PhD, my first paper was on trying to determine from the then known data and taking into account multiplicity of stars, unresolved multiples. How would it change the initial mass function? But uh, we didn't go, you know, much below one solar mass. That those days, the data were even poorer. So um, you are primarily looking into the compressive modes, P modes, right? I'm just... Uh, for the sun and main sequence stars, for evolved stars, we also have modes known as mixed modes. They, have, they are buoyancy modes in the core, they are pressure modes at the surface. Normally, in a star like the sun, the two cavities are completely separate. So the, sorry, the G mode cavity is completely separate from the P mode cavity. Basic, it's not completely separate. It's just that the, it's just, you can't have gravity modes in a convection zone. I have stars actually done this for intracluster medium, and there also it's kind of separated. Yeah. So what happens in an evolved star is that the evanescent zone of these gravity modes is very small. And also, the, as the star evolves, the gravity modes increase in frequency till they become similar to the frequency of sound waves, okay, as the P modes. So once that happens, and once the evanescent zone becomes small, the gravity modes in the interior can couple to the P mode in the exterior. And that's one of the reasons that for evolved stars, oh, look at this. One thing I didn't point out, look at where we are going here to radius of 0.2 stellar radii. In the case of the sun, we can barely go to 0.4 because in the sun, all we see are P modes. But the moment you have these mixed modes, mixed modes are G-like. So they have high amplitudes of the core. P modes have high amplitude of the surface. So a mixed mode has high amplitude of the surface so we can observe them easily. The bonus is that they have high amplitude in the core, so they encode structure of the core. So we can actually find core rotation rate properly. We can't do that with other stars that well. I mean, with the non-evolved stars. The other uh, question would be, sun is so highly magnetized. So do you in- Oh no, it's not highly magnetized compared to other stars. Sun, the average magnetic field is nothing. Think so of you M-dwarfs. So magnetic so field is included in the... Just in a the small model. perturbation. No, the magnetic field. In fact, the problem with the sun trying to see solar magnetic fields is that the magnetic pressure is so small that it doesn't really perturb the frequencies much. I see. You need the magnetic pressure to be... So there are two effects of the magnetic field. One is the Lorentz force, which is the V cross V term. The other is magnetic pressure. Okay, and if you want to be able to see the effects of magnetic fields, you want you know, at least one of the terms to be big enough. 
Right. And doesn't we don't see that evidence in the sun. So even in the strongest sunspots, the field is only about two to three kilogauss. Okay. Take M dwarfs. Now they are highly magnetic. They have much more magnetic activity than the sun, which is why, you know, when the news about the planet around Proxima Centauri came and people said, woo, it's in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. Maybe it's worth looking at whether we can live there. The Proxima Centauri is an M dwarf. It has humongous stellar winds and, you know, coronal mass ejections and stuff like that. And there are some models that suggest that if you have a planet, you know, under such circumstances, the stellar winds can blow out the atmosphere. There are some rival models too. Some say that maybe it can add to the atmosphere, but it, the question is, would you like to live around such a highly magnetic star? Think of all the radiation that's going to come to you, unless the planet itself is highly magnetized to block all that, uh, you know, all the particle radiation from the star. So the sun is not highly magnetic, no. Though all the interesting, if you study the sun from a distance, from the same distance as we study other stars, the sun would be boring. A medium aged, you know, very average star, simple to model. The reason it's so interesting to us is that we are seeing it from one AU and not five PC. So we see the details and we feel the effect of the details. So uh, another comment or question would be in the conclusion slide, you mentioned about angular momentum transport. Is there, mm -hmm. um, uh, is there any idea that can be borrowed from, for example, accretion disk physics? Uh, people are trying. So people are trying to modify stuff to see what happens, but the environments are quite different. So uh, there are bunches of theorists who are hard at work trying to figure things out, but nothing seems to work very well so far. Mm -hmm. But then it took us 35 years to solve the solar neutrino problem. It's only been less than 10 years since we know we have a problem with angular momentum transport. Give it time. <laughs> at least I think the solution will be less expensive. You don't have to build huge experiments to prove. Um, do we have other questions? Yeah, um, I, I have a short, quick question. Oh, yeah. also someone raised hand. I think they can go for uh, it. Yes, Juma, uh, let's, let's give... Uh, the... Please unmute and... Uh. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is Juma from Uganda. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. Uh, my question is in line with the uh, uh, core overshoot as being one of the physical uh, processes that you hinted on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm wondering whether this uh, core overshoot uh, mm -hmm. is a function of mass. In other words, the extent to which the core uh, increases Okay, during, for example, the main sequence phase, is it a function of mass? Does it depend on the uh, size of the star or we can fix it? It seems to depend on a function of mass, at least all recent studies, um, as I show on this slide, seems to show that the, if the uh, overshoot parameter increases and then saturates. Now, this region here, is these results are not from astro seismology, they're from modeling eclipsing binaries. So if you have an eclipsing binary, you know the, both the mass and the radius to a much better precision than even astro seismology, but you just have to do conventional modeling to model the stud. And these results, and even these red dots, which are my students' recent results, which is which appeared on archive yesterday, I think, um, seems to show that, yes, the amount of overshoot increases with stellar mass. The 
way we found this parameter is actually we looked now the size of the overshooting region changes on the main sequence. So this is we looked at the maximum extent of the overshoot because we were looking at fossil signatures. So we were studying not main sequence stars because there are very few main sequence stars with good seismic data. But subgiants, because subgiants don't have a core overshoot, uh, sorry, a convective core, but their core size is a fossil signature of what the core was like during the main sequence. So we go back and figure out what would the maximum overshoot be like as a function of mass. And this is our result. So, yes, at least at lower masses, there is an increase with the mass. After that, at least eclipsing binary su studies suggest that it saturates. People are trying hard to do G-mode seismology of higher mass stars. We have G-mode data on two solar mass, three solar mass stars, but they are proving inherently more difficult to do. So, but I think at some point we will be there. So then we'll be able to fill up this graph to see at least if there is the saturation here. That's a right. very good question. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Okay. Shamashkriti, are you still? Yeah, yeah. So I, I had a quick question about the explodability of uh, stars. So you, you mentioned previously that astroseismology is probably better at, you know, measuring the structure of more massive stars. And uh, no, 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 less massive stars. No, it's we can't do, we can't really find the structure of massive stars with astroseismology because very few of them pulsate. Uh, that's not true. Many pulsate, but they are single mode or two mode pulsators. So around here. And we are still learning how to do astroseismology when you have just one or two months. Okay, so what's the mass range of stars where it works well? So if you're talking of main sequence stars, it's a very narrow range, I would say, because of observational limits from point eight. That's a purely observational limit. And the actual physical limit would be is metallicity dependent because that would depend on whether or not you have an outer convection zone. So say effective temperatures of 6,500, maybe anything hotter than that, you probably won't have an outer convection zone. And then red giants, almost all have outer convection zones. So no matter what the mass is, red giants pulsate. So all those are fine. Yeah, so I had questions about actually the supergiants. So, you know. Uh, yeah, red supergiants, we don't know so much about. Uh, there is, and I haven't been completely up to literature. So the Austrians and Canadians have this microsatellite system known as Bright, which had been uh, concentrating its attention on nearby bright massive stars. And I am sorry to say I haven't really kept up with the literature in that field. It's bad enough to have two feet, one in solar physics and one in astrophysics, and then trying to get to the whole thing gets quite difficult. It would be difficult, different if I had a student in that, because then students keep you up to date with literature. So I asked my students, was there anything interesting today on archive? Sorry, we are on that about. side now, so yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so one last quick question yeah. before uh, we end. What are the, um, so uh, d does the plasma beta go into your model? Like what would be the- No, we thing? don't because in the case of the sun, the beta equals one layer is almost at the surface. Oh, so- all the interesting phenomena that we see on the surface are, of course, dominated by magnetic fields. All the interesting phenomena that we see in the inside has nothing to do with magnetic fields. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
that's because, as I said, the sun is not particularly magnetically, um, you know, the magnetic fields are not particularly high. Mm -hmm. Everything is magnetized, but it's the, the amount is so low that it doesn't change structure. So in I fact, if you, if you talk about, so I talked about the M-dependent splitting of the, so the way to look at it is this, the amount of splitting due to rotation is 450 nanohertz. The highest splitting that we see that that could be contributed, could be the generative word, by magnetic fields is 20 nanohertz. Mm. I see. So it's really small. And the reason I say could is because the seismic signature of magnetic field is not unique. You could have other large-scale asphericities for whatever reason, and they would have a similar signature. Got it. So... Okay, so um, do we have any other question for Shorban? Yeah, I have a quick question. So if there is like a magnetic fields in the stars, like um, like not like this, so in the solar case, then like high magnetic field, then is this picture, um, I mean, will this picture change, or, I mean, entirely or like it will change just slightly? I mean, how much deviation? Unlikely, unlikely to change entirely. Because remember, the cores of stars are extremely dense. Pressures are extremely high. And you will need very, very, I mean, you can do a simple calculation, right? I mean, the cores of stars can have 10 to the 18 pressure, 10 to the 18 CGS units. So what sort of B squared would you need for that? B squared of, so, okay, so square root of 4 pi, 8 pi times, no. Pressure, pressure goes as four by eight by anyway. So you would need really high magnetic fields. Right. Okay. Outer mm -hmm. layers, like the outer convection zone or the outer layers, that's a different issue altogether because the densities and pressures are not that high there. So yes, I would expect things to change, but I would be very surprised if the general evolution changes because the cores are unlikely to be affected much. I see. But that is speculation. Nobody mm -hmm. has made a model of high magnetic fields and done an evolution ca calculation. I mean, people are trying, but uh, just because one of the efforts that I heard of recently is to look at highly, highly magnetized white dwarfs because to see if you can explain superluminous type 1a supernovae, for example. So you put in have to put in high magnetic fields. You can do that. It's just a matter of uh, the, the structural part is easy uh, because all you do is change your hydrostatic equilibrium equation dp over dt equals minus g rho, the p instead of p gas is going to be p gas plus p magnetic. So yeah. you, it, it's not as though, I mean, conceptually, it's a difficult thing to do. It's just numerically. You have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah. And are there any like, uh, I mean, I know this from the cyclotron line, you can uh, measure the magnetic field, but are there like any other uh, kind of observational techniques by which one can measure magnetic field in the core of the stars? I mean, how, what, how is... No. Okay. <laughs> That's we, why had hoped, we, had hoped that, we had hoped that helioseismic data will tell us something about magnetic fields yeah. at the... Uh, base of the convection zone, which when we started doing this work was thought to be the only place where you could have a solar dynamo. We, all we got were upper limits. Okay. So. Okay, we again have another question on the chat. How can we stop the sun from turning into a red giant forever? Ooh, I have no idea. 
you can't make it bigger because then it'll actually make it heavier because then it'll actually uh, evolve even faster. If you really want to stop it from becoming a red giant, you'll have to, what do you want to do? Uh, you want to siphon off material, which will make all our orbits unstable. So, yeah, that's not a, no, it might be more practical to find another place to shift all of life on, on Earth to. But you have five billion, more. no, actually you have more than five billion years because five billion years is when the main sequence will end. It's another billion years before you actually start going up the red giant branch. So you have time. Maybe you can think of something clever. All right, it's way past the time and it was such an entertaining talk and then also the conversation. So people will uh, just, uh, just to, uh, Can I just uh, query for a minute? Just one, just one simple query. I joined late because of my prior commitment at Calcutta University. I just want to know, there was a graph which was a 2000 model, I think. So was there any update regarding that model? Like any recent there updates? There have been a few updates. There have been a few updates. If you look at the 2021 paper by Mark Katerina, Katerina Mark et al., because we were dealing with solar, so there you can find the inversion results for a few more recent models, but the essential picture doesn't change. The details oh, change, but the fact remains that there are regions which we still can't model very well that we understand. So particularly, if you look at the newest models, this region looks slightly different, but you know, our core remains more or less the same because that is probably due to other effects that we are not including. One of the effects that doesn't, most people don't include is early in the star's life, just when the uh, sun was entering ZAMS, some of the nuclear reactions were probably not in equilibrium. And that could have caused a structural, left a structural fossil, which is which is what we can't reproduce. But I mean, okay, even that, yeah, we just, yeah, we don't know yet. But things haven't changed much. But there's a 2021 paper, Margital, which is actually on solar abundances, but you'll see pictures on new models there. I think there's a 2007-ish paper by, oh, it's, hold on, you'll give me half a second. I will tell you, there's a Vignolis et al. paper. Vignolis et al. Search. A new generation of solar models. I'll put the link in the chat. It's 2017. So, yeah. But things are essentially the same, which is why I don't bother updating my figures. Okay. Okay. So, um, thank you. Shorbani again for such an excellent talk and also it is evident from the number of questions we got. Uh, thank you so much for being our colloquium speaker. And You're welcome and do send me the newsletter. Of course, yes, it is going to be out uh, tomorrow. So okay. I will send you a link. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I can send you the link to the first newsletter as well. Yes, please do. Yeah. And um, if you are happy to fill up one form for us and join us officially. Yeah, then... I, I, I definitely shall. So just send me the links. I'll do that. All right. Uh, I'll do that. Uh, thank you so much again. This oh, was really you're welcome. Good. And this was a fantastic conversation. So thank you. Let All right. We'll, we will call it a day. Okay. Bye-bye then. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.